Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. We're so happy to have you with us here today. Um, do you realize how important you are? That you are a critical link between people of faith of the past and people of faith of the future. We're going to be looking at that today. That's a truth of God's Word that we're going to dive into. And so I would invite you to get in a really centered place ready to receive because I think you're going to get great awesome blessing out of this as we look at the call we have in Scripture to generationally pass on what we believe and to receive from other generations what we believe. So, if that sounds good to you, you are in the right place, and again, we're really happy to have you here. Now, to get ready for that, I would invite you to slow down, kind of let go of anything that's distracting you as we listen to our prelude this morning. It's a really lovely piano piece, and I know it's just, it, it's going to wash over you in a, a wonderful, gentle way. So, no uh, further ado, let's dive right into that. call to worship, which you'll find printed in the bulletin. God has lavished us with every perfect gift from above. He us Let us praise God with glad hearts, and to do so I would invite you now to stand and sing our opening hymn together, 722, Lord speak to me that I may speak. Thank you. 
looking at Deuteronomy, um, and we're actually, the sermon focus this morning will be out of Deuteronomy. I think Susan was joking, like, I'm not sure my Bible can even open to Deuteronomy. When do we ever go there? Yeah, um, some people never make it there. They, they say, I've heard it jokingly said, Leviticus is the boneyard of Bible reading. Like, we start out fantastic. Genesis and Exodus are great. All kinds of cool stories. And then we get into Leviticus, and we just, if we can make it through that, Numbers finishes us off, and we never make it to Deuteronomy. But we're going to be looking at Deuteronomy this morning, fourth chapter, and there's some great, important lessons here. Um, let's avail ourselves of God's word with prayer before we actually read the text. Holy God, we thank you for your word. We open our heart to learn from it this morning. And may it bear fruit in our lives that honors you. God, may the words of my mouth, meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. Amen. All right, we're doing some select verses from Deuteronomy, starting in chapter 4, verse 1. So now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to observe, so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the Lord the God of your ancestors is giving you. You must neither add anything to what I command you, nor take away anything from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord your God with which I am charging you. And we'll go down to verse 6. You must observe them diligently, for this will show you your wisdom and discernment to the peoples, who when they hear all these statutes will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call to him? And what other great nation who has statutes and ordinances as just as this entire law that I'm setting before you today? But take care and watch yourselves closely so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. And then we're going to Mark chapter 7. Also select verses beginning in the first verse of chapter 7. Hear now God's holy word. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash, wash it, and there are also many other traditions that they observe to uh, the washing of cups, pots, bronze, kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human, human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. And then he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. We're going to move down to 14. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand there's nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them, then do you also fail to understand? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile since it enters not the heart but the stomach and goes out into the sewer? Thus he declared all foods clean and he said, it is what comes out of a person that defiles, for it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, 
licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. From there, he said, oh, that's it. <laughs> the word of the Lord. Sometimes I have to just labor and labor and labor to figure out where in the world God's calling us in a sermon. Um, this was not one of those sermons. It's funny, sometimes it's like these synchronicities, these happy little serendipities of things that are just point on with the text, pop up right and left all over the place. And that's kind of how this text has been. Um, I was watching a news program, kind of a commentary thing on YouTube, and it was an expose on how we are in, at the beginning of seeing one of the greatest transfers of wealth that we've ever seen in our country, of financial, of physical wealth, because in general, we have progressively seen since the Depression generations until the last generation or two, we have seen greater and greater abundance uh, occurring, and many of our boomers uh, saved or did well. Not all of us, you know, but, <laughs> many, but many. And as a result, as we see this generation passing, they are passing on an extraordinary amount of wealth. Uh, it, it was a fascinating program to watch this. And when I saw that and then later read this passage about what we are to pass on, it made me start thinking about what do we leave behind? What do we pass on? And man, that's great if we can pass on financial security to our children or our grandchildren to help them out. But what if we pass that on and along the way they never experience the richness of the things that are not tangible? What if, what if we leave them with a spiritual deficit? Now, the hard thing about this is, I was talking with Susan about, we pastors who are couples sometimes, you know, go back and forth about our sermon stuff. Not a whole lot, but I was talking last night about what I was thinking about sharing. She said, yeah, but, you know, our spiritual inheritance, we can't, it's not like wealth where we can ensure it gets passed on. You know, like if I, if I leave you with a bank account, you've got it one way or the other, but faith is something people have to respond to. So the sticky wicket is we are trapped between the fact that we have this call, this commandment upon us to pass on the inheritance, but we have no guarantee that it will be embraced, right? That's, that's the hard thing as parents or grandparents or church family is that we may labor and labor and labor, but faith is something that has to be responded to, and we just don't have control over it, but it doesn't get us off the hook, right? Just because we can't control the response doesn't mean that we are not on the hook for passing on. It, it, it also, as I read this text and I was reflecting on some things, it made me realize how often when we think about faith, or I'm going to say we because I found most people are a whole lot like me, you know, but I know for me, and I think for most of us, oftentimes when we think about our faith and growing in it and learning, it's all about me, right? <laughs> you know, like we're thinking about our development and our growth and what we, you know, what we get out of church, because you know, how many times have you heard someone say, "Well, I stopped going to church there because what I wasn't being fed, right? They weren't getting their needs met." That's a legitimate concern, but you know, the the interesting thing about the call of the gospel is, while at one level it is extraordinarily about us because we are called and redeemed by God and adopted into his family and made part of his family and intimately loved by God and have this tremendous personal relationship. At the same time, the gospel simultaneously says, our highest calling is to die to self, right? To take up our cross, to lay everything down, to put others before ourselves, 
to use our gifts for the common good. There's just Scripture after Scripture that points to if you've got it, you get that it's not all about you. You know? And this passage to me broadens the circle even further because I think normally, even when I think about service, I want to limit the idea to that of that to the, the service opportunities immediately available to me, right? The friends or family right around me. But the Bible thinks and speaks generationally. That, that's really mind-blowing if you stop and think about it. And it came home to me in a different way. Shortly before I read this, um, I had a conversation with Barrett I don't know, a couple weeks ago or so. Uh, a few weeks back, um, Barrett's been interested in learning some nature stuff, uh, animal tracking and that kind of thing. And so we've gone down to the banks of uh, Black River a couple times and done some animal tracking, and I'm teaching him how to look at the ground and see stuff other than dirt. And, and that's kind of been fun, because at first all he saw was dirt, and now it's like he can't even see dirt, it's just all tracks, and you know. <laughs> so, so it's really fun to watch that explosion of awareness and knowledge and, the, and it ripple over him. And there was a point in it as he was starting to learn, and he, I think the light went on of, this is like not something you learn over a weekend. Like, this could be a lifetime of homework. Like, this is bottomless. I'm sure you see this in martial arts all the time. You know, people want to get a belt. Well, no, it, like, it ain't about a belt, you know. Like, that's, that's a little icing on the cake, right, you know. And uh, I think the, the, the light was going on of, oh, this is a lot bigger than what I want, because Barrett starts saying, so he just innocently asked, well, when did you start learning this stuff? And I was like, well, you know, I guess... Uh, I, I first started thinking about the books I read. Well, I read this book when I was probably junior high or high school by Tom Brown, and that kind of set me on. And, I, and then I took some of his classes, and then I started taking classes. And I was like, yeah, but you know, even before that, my grandparents had a farm, and even as a little kid, I was, I remember just being able to roam on the farm, and I spent all these hours down at the creek and whatnot, and you know, and just kind of been a part of my whole life, and and what I didn't realize, what he really wanted to know was, is it too late for me to learn? <laughs> you know, you know I, didn't get, I didn't hear the question inside of the question until after I, I share a lot of this. And it, probably his heart's sinking as I'm going, well, you know, like, I came out of the womb looking at animal tracks. You know, like, they, as they walked me into the nursery in the hospital, I said, oh, look, a, a nurse's tracks or something, you know. But um, he said, he finally said, was it, is it like too late for me to start learning this stuff? And at first, my immediate reaction was like, no, you know, like what an absurd question. But I turned it around on him because he's helping me learn piano. I said, well, is it too late for me to learn piano? And, uh, and he kind of, and it was, you know, he, of course, he looked at me and said, oh, yeah, you're way too old. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> he didn't say that at all. He was like, no, 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 you know, like you need to be learning. And we had this conversation, it was all good and true, like at any stage, it's never too late to start learning, right? Like, you know, praise be to God, if we become a believer at 50, it's better to go to, you know, learn that and have the joy of the Lord in our lives for the last 20, 30 years, or even a day, than to never hear or know it, for sure. Um, but a few days later, this kept rattling around with me, and I, I had a conversation with Barrett. One of my mentors in all this, he has a little thing. When he's, when he's considering a big project or a big uh, move or idea, trying to weigh out a decision, sometimes he'll sit down and he does this sort of thought experiment, this imaginist exercise where he'll say, you know, if I could go back seven generations and talk to, like, my ancestors, people came before me, they had wisdom, they'd been through all this, and I could sit down with them, and I said, hey, I want to do this. What, what would they probably think of it? Would they say, good idea, bad idea, wise idea, not, you know? And he said, and then I think forward, like seven generations. If I do this, what's going to be the, the ripple? Like if I choose to do one or the other, what's the ripple that goes on way beyond me? And I was thinking about that, and I, I told Barrett about that, and I said, you know, here's the deal. We're concerned about what I can learn, what I can know, and what I can get out of this. But the reality is, that's, that's all fine and dandy, 
But there's a bigger picture to it where we're a living link in whatever we learn. And it needs to live behind. We need to live in a way where we're consciously trying to leave a legacy that's bigger than ourselves, beyond ourselves. Because we know from Scripture that if you look at any time it's talking about gifts, things we receive from the Lord, it's always for the benefit of the common good or others. Always. It always, I mean, it definitely gives tremendous blessing in our lives, but it never stops there. But we don't tend to think about it that way. We just don't think about it. And I said to him, I put it in more practical terms, I said, you know, like you're concerned about learning this at 31. And uh, 31, right? I got that right? Okay. <laughs> you're concerned about learning this at 31. I said, but think about this. What happens when, you know, Cameron or John Scott, Caroline, they start having kids or you start having kids and they come home and Uncle Barrett, every time they come home, takes them down to Sandy Beach and goes, look at this, I wonder what left this track. And they grow up just knowing that because you learned it now. You know, think about that. The, the, the fact that maybe it's not about you. I mean, it is about you, but it's more than that, right? What happens if, because you invest yourself now, that someone else doesn't have to wait until they're 30 or 50 or 40, but they grow up with it as part of their landscape, no pun intended. And more importantly, the things of faith. Now, if I plug people into nature, I always see them plugged into the Creator, and that's awesome. That's part of what motivates me to do that, because I just see them grow spiritually. But what if those nieces and nephews come home and one of their favorite things to do is to get to hear Barrett play and then he sits with them, right? And says, hey, listen. <laughs> like, and nudges them to listen. Or they, or you know, their aunt or their grandmother, a lot of you are already doing this. A lot of you are already doing a great job of this. You are you are bringing your grandkids, you're exposing them to the faith, and you're bringing it into their... What if when they visit with their aunt or their uncle or their grandmother, they read them a Bible story when they lay down to go to sleep at night? Or they say, hey, let's say our prayers. What are you worried about? And they lay down next to them and they say prayers. You know, I didn't... I actually didn't have that as a kid. I don't... I don't ever, my, my parents were really super good, godly folks who had, I think, genuinely the spiritual gift of helps, and they had a servant heart, and I, they taught me a lot about unconditional love and being willing to serve, like I just saw them frontline do that so much, um, but I, I can't remember a time where my parents said, you ought to pray about that. I don't ever remember ever seeing one of my parents pray. We didn't do graces at meals until I became a pastor, and then I came home, and it's like, uh, maybe Johnny should say a few words, you know, and then I was on task, you know, to say the family prayer. But I never saw that as a kid. And uh, I had to, literally, I started going to church. when I, I'd gone up until about third grade, and for whatever reason, I think we just got busy and got out of routine, and it fell off because I had... You know, there were four of us kids, and I had older brothers, and I think mom and dad were just running themselves silly. My dad worked a graveyard shift, and it just kind of evaporated. And I sort of brought myself back in high school out of spiritual curiosity. And I literally, and I don't know if I've ever told you this, maybe I have, but I didn't know how to pray, and I wanted to know how to pray. And I did something that today's children, it wouldn't work this way. We had this mystical set of books at our house called an encyclopedia. <laughs> Thing of the past. You can go to the Smithsonian and see one if you'd like. But, but I literally, I went in and I looked up the Lord's Prayer in an encyclopedia. And I memorized it, one, so I wouldn't feel 
like the odd man out in worship when they stood up and said this. It wasn't in the bulletin, and I didn't know it, you know, and I didn't want to be the odd man out. There was no cheat sheet like we had to make me feel comfortable. And, and I also, I just didn't know how to pray. So that's what I prayed, because like I didn't have any other model. Um, and I can't imagine how differently my life would have been. I'm very grateful for my life as it has been, but I can't imagine how many things would be different had I had folks in those more formative years who were doing the things I talked about. Hey, come here, sit with me in church today. Hey, let me read you a Bible story before you go to sleep tonight. Hey, are you worried about school? Can I pray for you? What would you like me to pray about? Really simple things, you know. We're always looking for the silver bullet program or the silver bullet pastor or the, you know, thing that's going to make it all work. And at the end of the day, it's as simple as tell your children and your children's children, right? And exposing them conversationally to the faith. And a lot of that is about helping them hopefully avoid hardship. We all know, most of us know that, you know, lessons are given but not always received. You know, sometimes we say all the right things and they still just got to learn on their own. Or I do this myself. Like, you know, if you're, if, if you're married, you know this because how many times have your spouse, how many times have heard your spouse say something like, you know, the other day so-and-so told me this and I just, you know, I really need to do something about that. And you're thinking, haven't I said this like 12 times already? You know, <laughs> didn't we go over this before? Why now are you listening? <laughs> you know, like, we see that with kids too, you know, it's just that transfer of knowledge. But that said, sometimes what we go through, we go through so that other people can learn from our mistakes. Um, I, I mentioned how there were all these God incidents. Yesterday, I had posted something online in my, I've got a little Facebook group for Christian yogis. I have this group for Christ Yoga and You. And I was sharing on there, I had just blown it recently in terms of like, I've been so good about eating well and getting my workouts in. Man, I just went off the rails a couple days ago and I was so disappointed. And then that morning, I read something that was just a punch in the stomach. It was a quote that said, um, you can never make a mistake twice because the second time, it's a choice. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, that stings. You know, you're like, you know better. The first time, you don't know any better. The second time, it's not a mistake. It's a choice, you know? And it was like, oh. That stinks, but I, and I read that and it really hit me. And then I had a, I read another quote that was really about how, okay, you've made mistakes, but now you can choose differently. And I'm like, today I'm going to choose differently. And I tagged a woman in it that I know, and she, because I just, there was something in my spirit said, man, she, she's, this is going to resonate for her. And she wrote this beautiful piece about how, you know, when we go through these things, sometimes it's so somebody else won't have to make that mistake. And again, getting beyond ourselves. I've heard it said, God never wastes a hurt. And by that meaning, like if we'll, there, there's a caveat to it. We've got to yield those things over to God. We have to yield those hurts over to God. We have to say, God, I don't know why I went through this, but... If you can use it, please use it. Please use it, you know, and help me see how it's going to be used. And sometimes we don't. We don't ever get to see the fruit of it. We just have to trust and do what we do, you know, and trust God to use it. Um, but my, my prayer for each of you is that even the hurts, both the gifts, but even the hurts, that God is going to take them in your life and he's going to use them as a blessing somewhere. You may not even get to see it, but trust that God's going to, that's my hope for you. That's my prayer for you. Even the hurts, God's going to use them in a blessing. In the meantime, consciously do everything you can that to pass on the wealth that we have, right? 
Wouldn't it be awesome if this hour, this time, was the time where the church gave the greatest transfer of wealth that's ever happened? And it wasn't material. Wouldn't that be awesome? You know? Wouldn't that be awesome? Amen. And let's, let's take a moment and pause, come before God with that on our hearts. God, we're, we are a bridge and uh, oftentimes we're, we're not thinking about it that way. We are that span between generations. Uh, it, we've just recently watched the Olympics and we watch these runners who run in a relay and they have to pass a baton. Well, we're the folks who, you know, there, there comes a point in our life where at one point someone was running along and they were trying to pass off the baton of faith to us. And we were kind of reaching back and trying to take hold of it as we were starting to our run, our leg of the race. And there comes a point where maybe we're carrying it together for a while. They've got one end of it. We've got one end of it. But one of these days, we look up and we realize that we're the one carrying the stick. And it's on us. But you know what? We're just a link. It's our job to carry it faithfully, to not drop it as we go around the track, and to do our best to hand it off well to the next runner. So to that end, we come before you, God, knowing that we are, we are this living link. We are the runner holding the stick right now. In some ways, we're receiving it. In some ways, we're passing on. Sometimes we feel like we're carrying it alone. But we're never alone, Lord. Because your spirit is there with us. It's guiding and leading us. It's giving us strength when we are weary and we don't want to run. It's giving, us, it's giving us mindfulness of how to take the next step. We lean into that. And we lean into the spirit this morning and ask for your guidance and direction that we might run and we might run faithfully and well. So that, not to mix metaphors, God, we are a bridge spanning the gap so that the gospel would not fall flat on the next generation, but the gospel would land in a way that is vibrant and living and not just empty tradition. Jesus had to confront the fact that his people in his hour, there was a lot being passed along, but it was hollow tradition and in the process, they were missing the truth. They were missing the commandments and they were replaced them with traditions of men. We don't want to just pass on to the next generation. You know, family suppers and vacation Bible schools as traditions in and of themselves. What we want to pass on is a living relationship that those things point to. May we, may we do those in a things, way that they point beyond themselves so that people have a living connection with you. God, we thank you that you are a living God, that you are intimately a part of our lives. And this morning, we come before you as a family of believers, and we lift up to you words that your son taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, now we're at a time in worship where we can honor God through the giving of our tithes and offerings. You know, every bridge needs a budget, <laughs> right? And one of the ways that we support the bridge is to give. That's, that's how we are part of this fantastic building of a bridge from one generation to the next. So with that spirit in mind, I would invite you to give and to give generously.
Holy God, bless these gifts to your glory and to your honor, and may they take the gospel and move it forward from our lives into the lives of those who come behind us. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. I charge you this week to tell the story, to tell it joyfully, to tell it frequently, <laughs> to share it with someone who is a child in the faith, whether they're two or 102, <laughs> share the story and be a blessing and pass on the blessing that you have been given. And now as you do so, may the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you in a very special way now and forever. Amen. Well, thank you so much again for being here in worship. We hope someday, if you're in the Walnut Ridge area, you'll come by and visit us in person. We have worship at 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings. If you have any questions about upcoming activities or things going on here at the church, go to our website, fpcwalnutridge.org. There's all kinds of information there, other worship services that can help you tap into the life of ministry here happening at Walnut Ridge. So, I hope I will see you back next week in one of our online worship services. Until then, may God bless you richly, and I hope you have an opportunity to reach out to someone and pass on a little bit of faith through care this week.